Welcome to Unplanned and Untold, a podcast that dives into the real life unexpected twists of facing an unplanned pregnancy in college. Join us as we listen to the unplanned and untold stories of those who have overcome the odds in order to achieve their goals. Welcome back to another episode of Unplanned and Untold. I'm your host, Caitlin Willing, and today we have a special guest joining us, someone who has made significant strides in the world of business and leadership. With an extensive career history that spans decades and industries, I'm thrilled to be interviewing the new president and CEO of Baby Steps, Carrie Chandler. Carrie brings not only a wealth of experience to the role, but also a deeply personal connection to our mission. On today's episode, we will discuss how his personal and professional experiences will shape the future of Baby Steps. Without further ado, let's welcome the one and only Carrie Chandler. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Caitlin. I'm excited to be uh on the podcast with you. I've watched so many of them and you do such an outstanding job and every story is different. Every story is important of these young moms. And, you know, I'm I'm glad to just be a part of it. We are so happy to have you and we're going to dive deep in starting off from the bat because I would love all of our listeners to hear the very unique way that Baby Steps has landed on your radar and become a piece of something you want to invest in. Yeah. Okay. So um, I was working at the university, Auburn University, and uh, helping tech startups get going. And I had a student that was uh, doing it as a female is doing a tech startup. And and one day she said, are you Chapel Chandler's dad? And I said, yeah, how do you know her? And my daughter Chapel has a uh, an internet following. Uh, she's an influencer for style. So she has over a hundred thousand people that follow her, but she also shares her story about being a young mother and, um, you know, single mother and having unplanned pregnancy in college. So, so she said, I, I, I'll follow chapel. And I just think she's wonderful. And then just out of the blue, she said, wait, do you know about baby steps? And I said, no, what, what is Baby Steps? So, well, that's an organization here that helps women who have unplanned pregnancies in college. I said, wow, that is really cool. So she sent me a link to the website and I showed it to my wife, Suzanne. And we said, we, we need to support these guys. This is because we've been there. We've walked through it. Uh, our daughter, Chapel, had uh, a pregnancy her freshman year in college. And so we've we walked that path. Wow. So when Chapel found out she was pregnant, take us back because we talk a lot on this podcast about the the women and what they're feeling and how scary it is to be a student mom and how to navigate that. But what we've never touched on before is the parents' point of view and how it affects the parents of these student moms. So take us back. Do you remember when Chapel told you she was pregnant and how did you and Suzanne navigate that? Yeah. So Chapel is a very, very talented person and she can do almost anything. We have four children. Uh, They all have their unique gifts, but Chapel can do most anything. And so she wanted to get a performing arts uh, degree. And so she went to Savannah College of Art and Design on a combined uh, honor scholarship, which means that, that she auditioned it by singing, by doing a play, by writing a paper, by creating a video, by dancing. I mean, all of these things, because she could do it all. Wow. And, you know, she self-taught how to play music on a piano. And and so she was living her dream. She went off to Savannah College of Art and Design, and she was going to live her best life there. And so around Thanksgiving, she actually um, was going through as a debutante. And so on this, my recollection is a Thursday evening or maybe it's a Friday, we, you know, got all dressed up in tucks and tails and, you know, had this big debut and everything for her. And the next day she said, hey, I need to talk to y'all. Uh-huh. And she closed all the doors. And I thought, okay, that's never happened before. This is really going to be bad news. <laughs> and so uh, she told us that, you know, she had an unplanned pregnancy. And, you know, I, you never know how you're going to react to something like that. And I'm looking back, I, I'm i pleased with the way we did because 
Suzanne and I were both just, okay, so what's the next step? And we didn't spend any time saying, what were you thinking? Or mm. why did this happen? You know, stupid questions that people will say, you know, how did this happen? You know, right. it was just like, well, okay, so how do we go to the next step? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what do we see? And, you know, how are you going to stay there and have a baby? And so she stayed one more semester there okay. um, as, a, as a pregnant um, student, you know, passed out in a class one time, you know, the kind of things that, that happen. And so then she transferred to uh, our hometown which had a university in it. So she kind of had to change her whole view of what her future looked like. Okay, maybe we're not going to be in performing arts. Maybe I need to do something a little more practical because I've got a child that I've got to um, support. And so she changed to mass communications and was just very successful there. But, you know, I, I always felt bad for her because I was a pretty tough dad. And, you know, I expected a lot. I had, we had rules, we had right. discipline, we had expectations in our house. And I can't imagine for her what it was like to have to face Suzanne and I and, and say that. But she did. I mean, the, the one word that comes back to mind in all of this is courageous. Wow. I mean, she was just so courageous about all of this. And she um, she's a person that doesn't look back a lot, doesn't spend a lot of time in regret, doesn't hold grudges, doesn't even remember who wronged her. Right. And parents always remember who wronged your child. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So but, you know, she she just moves forward, just moves forward all the time. But at the University of West Georgia, you know, Chapel um, had her her baby, uh, Molly Kate, in August, and then, you know, went back to school. But, you know, it was a it was a tough time for us. I'd had this really successful career and, and I did tech startups. So okay. it's very cyclical, very up and down. You, you know, one starts and it's it's struggle, 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 and then you succeed and then you sell it and you got momentary success, but then you start all over again and you're back to zero. And so we were doing this. And then in a period between startups, I had gotten in the real estate business. And because my dad had run a real estate business and he had gotten really sick. And so I took it over for him. And um, which was really great in the early 2000s until it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so right around the time that Molly Kate was born was the Great Recession of 2008. Yeah. And if you were in the real estate business, that meant that whatever you were making went from that to about zero. Mm -hmm. And so it was really bad timing for us. Right. Uh, her older sister, Mary Lawrence, was in college out of state at Auburn. We lived in Georgia. And so, and Chapel was going to a private school. Okay. Now, how are we going to manage all of this? How is she going to manage all of this? Because we were problem solvers, but suddenly we didn't have the magic to solve all the problems. We didn't have the resources to solve all the problems. We would have we would have made things as easy as possible on her if we could, but that's not the way it played out. It played out that she had to work two jobs. You know, she had to go to school. You know, they lived with us. And so we were part of the child care, you know, um, mix. And my mom would help and other uh, grandparents. And but, you know, it was a, it was a big change. Then we had two teenagers at home had a son in high school, had a daughter just starting high school. And we knew that on another 18 months, we got another college education to pay for. So it was really, from a global perspective, a lot of stuff going on at one time. And I think that made it the most challenging for all of us, you know, that we couldn't, we didn't have the resources to just snap our fingers and solve all these problems. In right. fact, we even got after Molly Kate was probably about 18 months to two years, we had to leave. 
I had to leave the state and go to another state for my job okay. because real estate was gone. It was dead. Right. So I did what I always did, which was started something else. And so we had to leave chapel and Molly Kate and um, and then she really had to fight and struggle. You know, she worked a couple of jobs. But let me tell you how courageous she was. Mm -hmm. Chapel just didn't see obstacles as impossible. Chapel decided that she was going to go out for sorority rush Gosh. with the, the girl who had the baby. The girl with the baby going into Greek life. Wow. Right. And it's like everybody said, Chapel, you, you, you know, you're you just you're setting yourself up for disappointment and heartbreak wow. said, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. And she just did. And I think all but two cut her immediately. Right. And then two gave her a look. One gave her a bid. Wow. They embraced it. Right. You know, they didn't say, oh, Scarlet Letter, you know, you're not welcome in the Greek world. They mm -hmm. said, how can we help you? You know, do you need us to babysit? And they did. Wow. And they really, they came through. And so she prospered. She she did it all again, you know, worked two jobs in a sorority, mm -hmm. had a baby. And, um, and at the same time, she's winning awards for mass communications for best writer um, at the university. She was published in a textbook and, um, and even when she graduated, she got the Shea Cowart Award for most courageous student, you know, for overcoming. And um, and she was. She was just, she's always been an overcomer. Mm -hmm. And she only saw obstacles as temporary things. And so um, she really, really had to grow up, you know, particularly when we left town right. because – you know, it's easy when when you have parents say, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you right. do this? And, you know, we tried to from our from our time and from our treasure do those things. But then we just left. And, you know, it she would say that it changed her life, made her grow up. And it was the best thing that ever happened to her. Absolutely. The perseverance when rubber meets the road, you can't take those experiences back from someone as hard as they are. I truly believe that those hard experience in life, experiences in life, they shape us, they shape yeah. who we are and they give us a sense of identity and work ethic in a way, because you don't have another choice. Yeah. You have to get up. You have to do all of the things. And she persevered through all of that, which is absolutely outstanding. And to hear that Greek life rallied around her. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's, yeah. that's really what it should be all about. Yeah. And on this episode, we oftentimes hear that there is just such a stigma on college campuses and there is such a huge fear of what are other people going to think about me while I'm walking around pregnant on campus or as a yeah. single mom, you know, as a student at a university, do those same fears exist within grandparents? Yeah, I think so. And but again, Suzanne and I were pretty matter of fact about it. Like, yeah, okay, a lot of people are going to judge us. A lot of people are going to judge her and say, oh, you know, I knew she was not as great as we thought. You know, mm. she's made a mistake. Oh my gosh. You know, so, um, but we were like, okay, there are going to be people that, you know, turn their back on us and they're going to be people that turn toward us. Right. And, you know, we focused on the ones that turned toward us because there were people that offered to help. There were people that gave her free babysitting that said, oh, you know, I can keep Molly Kate, you know, bring her to my house. Yeah. And so, you know, we had lots of friends that that provided support in so many ways. And there were people that did just sort of turn their backs and, mm -hmm. and walk away and say, that's OK. That yeah. reveals, you know. That reveals character too. So um, we just didn't dwell a lot on that. But yeah, you start thinking about it and you start thinking about, um, you know, I had some leadership roles in the church and, you know, how is this going to be perceived and what are people going to say? And yeah, so we, you know, we certainly had to think about that. But 
we also were just grounded in reality. Like this is our life. This is what's real. Let's uh, what's the next step. Let's yeah. just keep moving. One foot in front of the other. Yeah, absolutely. So what advice would you give another parent who is finding out that their adult child is unexpectedly pregnant? To try to be as calm as possible, to realize that while this is a change in the course, her life's not over, her future's not over. And, you know, I, I think about, hard to say, but our little blue line you know, Molly Kate, you know, she turned 16 last week. And uh, sorry, I get emotional about her. And, you know, she's one of the greatest joys in our life. Mm -hmm. And our family wouldn't be the same without her. That's right. So, you know, would I change it? I don't think so. Would right. Chapel change it? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. You know, would life have been easier? Well, probably, but you just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe she would not have grown up. Uh, his, his Chapel wouldn't have grown up as fast. She wouldn't have matured. She wouldn't right. have been able to address change and difficulty. And, you know, so um, and maybe it helped us, you know, get past pride in a lot of areas, you know, to say, well, yeah. We've got mistakes in our family too. And, but you know what? We're not going to own it like a mistake. So I would say that you've just got to remain calm and you've got to just say, how do we help? What's the best solution? How do we help this child to finish her college education and to help this grandchild to get a good start in life? So that's, um, and I would also say to those who have friends in this position, you know, what should they do? They should say, how can we help? You know, how how can we help? What what can we do to support you? What can we do to support your child, your grandchild? You know, that's how you become, a, you know, you show your friendship, you show your support. And, um, you know, you don't just sort of wave as you walk away and like, oh, we'll be thinking about you. Right. <laughs> you know, that sort of dismissive, like, oh, crap, I'm glad it's you and not me, right. you know, is what that really means. Um, it really could happen to anybody. And I think that's what people forget. I mean, yeah. one out of every four women experience an unplanned pregnancy. So they are a lot more common than people yes. like to talk about. Right. And to hear how you and your wife have embraced Chapel and her unplanned pregnancy and willing to talk about it. I think that is a whole nother level because as somebody who's gone through an unplanned pregnancy, I don't think we give enough credit to our parents. And I don't think we exactly realize in that moment, how their lives are going to change by decisions that we made. When you're in it, you're thinking, oh my gosh, my life, da, 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 da. But there's another layer to that, our parents' yeah. lives. And our team has worked really hard to create um, a grandparent's guide. It's called the Unplanned Grandparent Guide. Because what we are realizing is, yes, student moms need help navigating unplanned pregnancies, but so do their parents. <laughs> yes. And so we created a free resource on our website, babysteps.org slash grandparent that provides detailed advice and support for those that have an adult child navigating an unplanned pregnancy. Um, to just be able to talk through tangible ways that yeah. you can be there for them. And also if you have a friend going through it, how you can step up and just offer support. So I really hope people take this opportunity to look through this resource guide and just find freedom in talking about these unplanned pregnancies and how they're affecting others. Yeah. So I want to shift gears a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, we are so excited to announce that you are, have officially joined the Baby Steps team as our president and CEO and our co-founder, Michelle Schultz. She will remain hub executive director at Baby Steps at Auburn University. And she's really excited to, you know, continue to focus on that hub. And all of us have been working really closely together over the past year to make this transition as easy as possible. So I'd love for you to tell all of our um, people listening, what expertise do you see? see yourself bringing to the table and how do you see that helping baby steps? Okay, great. Well, I am so excited about it. And 
And I'll say, first of all, that there's so much that I don't have to bring to the table because one of the greatest delights in getting engaged with you and the team and Michelle is that you have done so much already. You know, in the seven years, it's not run by the seat of the pants. It's not, you know, just a hodgepodge, you know, try to get things. Y'all run this like a very professional organization and you use best, best practices. You use the best technologies. You know, you're so, so professional about this that it's a huge relief to me. It's like, I'm not, you know, I don't have to go fix anything. You know, I'm not the doctor coming in to say, all right, put all this mess back together again and, and make it uh, whole or, you know, healed. That's not the case at all. You know, it's what the opportunity is for me is to scale it. Mm -hmm. And so I've spent my life. I'm, I'm not good at being somebody else's employee apparently. <laughs> so I've always started businesses, you know, from, the day I graduated from college, you know, and I started doing export trading and traveling all over the world and selling U.S. goods abroad. And then when tech startups happened in the early 90s, then I started uh, a tech startup and did five of those over about 35 years. And that's what I loved. I loved starting something from nothing, mm -hmm. for building a brand that no one's ever heard of, telling a story that people don't know, and getting to the them to engage in the product or the service or the brand. And so, you know, what I've done is launch businesses and brands in 55 countries around the world and scale those up. So, and all of it would start with, a couple of guys, like, you know, two, three, five guys like, OK, we're going to go start this thing. And that's kind of what y'all did. You know, y'all started with two gals. And so, OK, how are we going to do this? And you just figure it out. And so you have done a remarkable job of figuring it out. And everything runs so well in Auburn. And so um, as I got involved and and learned more about you guys, you know, I found out that you're having lots of other universities who've come and said, help us. Right. We need this too. And it's kind of like the parenting thing. You could say, no, we're good. <laughs> you know, you know, sorry, you have a, you know, an issue too, you know, that girls get pregnant on your colleges, right. college campuses, but Hey, we're fine. Right. You know, you can just wash your hands and say, good luck. Mm -hmm. Um, but what you've done is chosen to take that on and say, how do we help these universities? How do we create a replicable model, an extensible model, a scalable model that we know that the principles and the guidelines that have worked here can be replicated in Tuscaloosa or Athens or Orlando or Nashville? You know, there there's so many universities. I've lost count. You know, I think it's well over 25 now that have reached out and said, help. And so what we're trying to do and what I hope to be able to do is help Baby Steps and the national team to scale this up. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got an extremely talented team. And I also um, I'll say about my background, too, is that I've also run. A, a nationally, um, uh, a donor dependent national nonprofit too. Right. So, which is different than selling a product. And so I did that for a couple of years. So got an, an idea of how you create donor programs and you, you sell the concept and the idea to have people where they want to participate and be a part of what you're doing. And I think Baby Steps has an incredible story to tell. And we've got to scale it up. We have to create the, and this is what we've been working on, create the processes and the systems that make it replicable. But then the biggest challenge is raising the funds mm -hmm. and helping others to raise the funds. I mean, we, you know, we can't just, if University of Georgia and Athens says, hey, we, we need one too, we can't go raise the money and, and show up. They need a grassroots support system there, but we can show them how to replicate what's been successful here. 
it's been really, really rewarding to see how Tuscaloosa, University of Alabama, is following this lead. And so we've just green lighted them to to open up because they have diligently organized and gotten advisory boards and raised funds. And, you know, they've raised almost four hundred thousand dollars. And, you know, this is about what it takes to get to step one to start this program. And they have a real need. And we've got a great staff there that is building, you know, Mm -hmm. that's going to be the first replicable success. So we're very, very excited about Tuscaloosa and the University of Alabama. Absolutely. And expanding to different hubs, you know, across the nation. It's a dream, Carrie. It's a dream for all of us on staff and our national team to piggyback off of what you said, man, they're the heroes because this team not only is trying to propel baby steps expansion wise, but they're that solid support system for our hubs, for Auburn, which is fully up and running. And for Tuscaloosa, that is almost ready to open their doors. They've just started, you know, hiring two other positions to get ready to open their doors. So where do you see us going long-term? Well, is <laughs> as far as we can go, you know, and I, I mean, I see that there's no reason why this wouldn't become a national movement. Mm-hmm. The only thing that would keep it is lack of information, lack of spreading the word. So it really becomes a marketing and PR opportunity to share this story. So that's our our next challenge is how do we let others know? And of course, there's some that already know they're coming to us. We've got to create more success stories. And then we have really a body of work to say to any university that comes like, okay, we've got a proven track record here. We've got systems and processes. And if you want to be a part, and you're you're willing to follow the guidelines that we have, then we'll support you and you can be a baby steps in Topeka, Kansas, you know? So that's, um, that's really the challenge. And it's the opportunity. I mean, it really, unplanned pregnancies, like you said, it's not unique to this generation. Right. It's not unique to just campuses. It's a fact of life. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we know that, a high, high percentage of young women who have early pregnancies in college are not able to finish. Mm -hmm. And the financial difference in their lifetime is just dramatic. And so if there's, if we can provide that support system, we can provide housing or diapers or childcare and, and meals, the things that they need that they may not have a support system to provide, that this could make a tremendous difference. I mean, if Chapel had had this, it would have been so much better for her. She would have finished uh, college so much sooner, Mm -hmm. right? It was a long, long slog doing it the way that she did it and, and the hardship. And it's still hard even with baby steps, right? But we're giving them a leg up. We're providing some resources so that they can focus a little more on their education and their child and not so much on just pure survival. Absolutely. And I may be a little biased, but I can't imagine investing in anything else other than an organization that is literally leaving generational impacts. Like it is. you are affecting that student mom, but you are also affecting her child and that child and her, her future and her children. I mean, we have the ability to truly leave a lasting legacy when supporting an organization like Baby Steps. Absolutely. So one thing I want us to touch on, and of course, it's not the most fun aspect of it, but talking about bringing you on as the new CEO and president, I'm sure people are wondering, how is this little organization able to afford such an amazing man with such extensive history and startups and businesses and such? And so I kind of wanted us to talk to our, our listeners a little bit about how you are able to donate your time versus us paying you. So you're saying I sound expensive? (laughs) I would pay you big bucks if I had big bucks to pay you. I was introduced to it. 
Uh, Michelle invited us. I said, well, who are these people that keep donating? Let's let's meet them. So came over, visited. And so as they got to know me a little bit, they said, you've got some strategic strategic skills that might help us sort of figure out how we're going to do this. I said, yeah, sure. And I was in my other role at the university, but we found some times to get together with the team and just strategize. And it sort of clicked. It just seemed like the questions you were asking, I had answers to that were plausible and mm -hmm. sensible. And so we all just sort of clicked in it and it kept going. And then they asked me to join the board and I did that. And, you know, Michelle said one day in, in one of our meetings, you know, we, we really, she said, you know, I've birthed this, I brought this, I love managing the hub in Auburn, but I'm not equipped to replicate this and oversee a large organization that's spread out in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. He said, we really need a CEO. And I said, yeah, you really need a CEO, <laughs> but you can't afford one. She right. goes, no, can't <laughs> afford one. And then somewhere along in that, that time period, I said, oh, by the way, I'm going to retire on March 31st. And she said, well, what are you going to be doing? I said, retiring, <laughs> you know, playing golf and tennis and, you know, doing whatever the, you know, typical things that re retired people do. And so, well, you'd make a really good CEO. And I said, mm hmm Wink, wink. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, well, I was really thinking of, taking some time off after 40 straight years. And really, if I think about it, I've worked since I was 11. So uh, there's a lot more years than that. Yeah. And I was thinking, okay, I just, all right, tell you what. I said, here's what I'll do is I need to take six months off and I need to take six months off to just do nothing and, and see what that feels like and enjoy life a little bit and spend some time with grandkids and spend some time um, with my wife and, and so, um, but after that, when we get to September, I'll be ready. And I would love to join your team and I in a position where I don't have to be paid, don't want to be paid. So um, it's uh, something I'm able to donate to, to Baby Steps of my time mm -hmm. and uh, my expertise. So I'm excited to be able to do that and hope that, you know, all the the ideas and the promise that that we have for it can come to fruition. That would be a real cap to um, my career, I think. And Suzanne and I went to a um, J. H. Ranch has a um, uh, a marriage um, seminar, marriage retreat out in California. We went to this a couple of years ago, and and they asked us to read a book called The Last Arrow, and basically it was about if you only had one arrow left in your quiver, mm -hmm. what battle is worth using your last arrow? Wow. And so I said, you know, you really need to think about that. You need to think about your legacy. You need to think about, you know, how do you want to end it? Y'all are all in the fourth quarter, mm -hmm. you know, of your lives and the clock's ticking down. Mm -hmm. And when Michelle presented this, I said, yeah, this is what I want to use my last arrow for. Mm -hmm. And so if if we could make all this, you know, come to fruition, it'll be, you know, very, very fulfilling and something that's very personal to Suzanne and I that we're willing to, you know, postpone retirement and, you know, mm -hmm. put our our, you know, nose to the grindstone and just, you know, let's keep working and do something that could have a generational impact. And I'm very excited to be be part of that. So proud of what y'all have done already. And just, you know, want to see how can we replicate this and make it available for more universities and more families. 
Absolutely. And we are so incredibly grateful for your generosity and for Suzanne's too, for loaning you to us like this. <laughs> and mm -hmm. honestly, the sky's the limit. Um, we have a staff that is just so eager to see this on every campus around the United States and to have it a household name. Everybody knows the YMCA. Everybody knows these other nonprofits. And it's our goal to make it that Baby Steps is that exact same household name that people know about and can see the generational impact that they're investing in. So as our CEO and president, and as a parent who has also navigated through an unplanned pregnancy with your daughter, how do you want to see people support these women at Baby Steps? I hope they'll see what we see, which is, wow, this could have a generational impact. Mm -hmm. This is something that every dollar is going to go to supporting someone who is trying, fighting, and struggling to get their college education to give their child a better start in life. And so, you know, what's not to like about this story? You know, wh where's the negative in this story? I don't, I don't see one. I hope that people will see it and be energized by it and say, this is a cause that's worthy of some of my treasure and be willing to, to donate to us and to share the story with others too, because everybody knows people who are experiencing uh, these changes in their families, you know, whether they're in this town or in another town or different university, everybody's heard this story. This is not, like I said, unique. It is a universal story. And I think we all could do so much to to support it and to help another generation of, of young people. Absolutely. And if we have any new listeners on the podcast today, if you're wanting to learn more about Baby Steps or wanting to know how you can stay involved, you just visit babysteps.org. And from there, you'll be able to sign up for our email newsletters by joining the movement. You'll be able to learn more about how you can volunteer at our current hubs at Auburn and in Tuscaloosa, along with discovering tangible ways that you can monetarily invest in an organization that is truly impacting generations. And Carrie, thank you again for taking the time to share your heart with us. Um, it really, it really is remarkable that you have chosen to stand beside us and take us to the next level and help us expand and reach our dreams. And so thank you for your generosity of your time and for sharing your story with all of our listeners. Well, it's my honor to do that. And I've really enjoyed being with you today and appreciate so much what you're doing to help get this word out. Um, your, I think your podcast is amazing and just one of the great tools that we have to share our story. Oh, well, thank you for that. And for all of our listeners, we hope to have you back for our next episode of Unplanned and Untold. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed that episode as we are committed to bringing you the real raw stories of those who have defied the odds and achieved their goals. But we're not stopping there. We are dedicated to improving our podcast quality so that we can reach an even wider audience. If you believe in the power of these untold narratives, consider donating or sponsoring this podcast by visiting unplannedanduntold.com.